see her back with us. Okay, now um, very, very quickly, Monica, I think uh, I should give your introduction because there are a few participants who were not there in that uh, offline class that day. So what are we, I'm going to do is give you a brief introduction to them all. And then uh, you can start sharing your screen yeah. and start presenting. Just, give me just, just a Yes, just yes. a minute. Whilst you do that, can I just go away half a minute? Yes, please. You want to do that now? I know myself. I don't listen to. Okay. All right. Listen. All right. To finish. Sure. 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 In a minute, I stop my micro. Okay. Okay. Fine. So uh, a very good evening to all the participants. I think we don't have the full strength as of now, so more people will keep joining in. But uh, let me just give everybody a brief introduction of uh, today's expert speaker, that is Professor Monica. She is a professor and pioneer scholar in the Europeanization of Health and also an adjunct director of uh, Chitkara Spark Center at Chitkara University, which is a multidisciplinary European studies center. She is the Senior Research Fellow Emeritus at CNRS, which is the French National Center for Scientific Research and affiliated with PACTE, Social Science Research Laboratory. And uh, she has specialized in the comparative study of uh, health policy and healthcare systems in the European Union. She has extensively published on the medical profession and health insurance on the politics of healthcare reforms especially in France and in Germany, on the tainted blood scandal on AIDS policies in Europe, and has been the first scholar investigating the impact of the European integration process on the national and international health domain. And today she would be talking about ill-structured problems in healthcare governance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, before I hand it over to her, I would like all the participants to listen attentively and whatever questions they have, they can uh, put it in the chat box and then we can take it up at the end of the session. So, uh, it's over to you, uh, Professor Monica. You may start sharing your screen, please. Yeah. So, I have to to put on the, on the arrow, no? Or just open my file. Yes, yes. First, you open your file, minimize. And I, okay, and, and then I go it. the file. Yeah, Just open go. your file, minimize it, and then you have to click on the arrow, which says... Minimize it, minimize yes. it. Correct. Yep. Then you go to the... No, no, that's now. not... I got the wrong one. Just a minute. No problem. Take your time. I, I put the... Oh my God, it's going so quickly. And I look at it, it changes. Wow, oh, I can't get the full screen off. Oh, here it is. Okay, now we start again. The arrow is gone. The arrow is there. Thanks. Ah, okay. Yeah. So please click on the arrow and then the full screen thing. Yeah. What do we see? But doesn't seem to work. Can you see this? Yes, yes, of course. Yes. But then I don't see you anymore. Is this normal? It's okay, no problem. Uh, what you do is make it full screen, please. Yes, that's yeah. perfect. That's perfect. Yes. Go, uh, yeah, this is yeah. your title slide. We can see you. We can. I think you can see me as well. No, I don't see you. That's it's okay. So it's okay. I think my face is very familiar to you, Professor Monica. So <laughs> even if you don't see me, it works. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I think we let's not disturb this presentation. It's perfectly fine. Uh, what do you see? What do you see now? No, not now. And not anymore. I mean, we are seeing your screen, but you know, we are seeing the other other uh, slides as well. You okay, so I go back. Documents which you made earlier, yes. But how can I do this? There are no files here. Yeah. Yes. Good. Make it full screen. No, full I screen. Know. Yes. Maybe there's something where I can see you. It's not comfortable. Not it's to okay. See it. Just make it full screen here. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Just try, okay, then. try changing the slides once 
and let me see if it works go to the next slide please yes of course yeah you may go back to the title slide and you may start presenting okay so uh, what i try to do although i don't see you and you can't do you <laughs> okay maybe at the end uh, we can try that once again for the time being your presentation is the most important thing okay you hear me and you can yes. see yes i can, the, the you. I can hear you i can see your presentation as well but you uh, don't see me do you see me yes of course i oh, see it as just well. me who doesn't see anybody okay <laughs> Because this is uh, this is with Google uh, Zoom. I think it works better with me. Anyway, I will start. But before I start, I want to say a little word, which an idea which came to me uh, when we went to the uh, hospital presentations, and yeah. I listened. I listened for the first time really to what private health insurance do to people, because we have in Europe only complementary ones and. Uh, so uh, I want to take up one, one little word about the big differences. So uh, if the uh, professionals who listen to me, they will surely know how private health insurance is work in, uh, in, uh, in India. And if I understood rightly, uh, they have the public one has limits per person for the expenditure. And others, if you voluntary ones where you can sort of make your own contract or your employer makes it, maybe you have sometimes heavy illnesses excluded because they existed before, like maybe a cancer or, or they, include, they exclude something like AIDS or something. Correct, um, correct. This is correct. So they, what they, they, they exclude certain things, and if there is a pre-existing disease, that also is excluded. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the premium would depend upon a number of factors, like for example, your age. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Coverage, okay. response, all that. Yeah. I understood correctly. Yes. So I want the students, the professionals, especially, because professionals are important. <laughs> um, to make it very clear, when we talk about public health insurances, or sometimes they have a private status, but they do a public work, uh, they are what we could call compulsory health insurances. And that's why we call it collectively public, even if they may have sometimes legally a private status, like in Holland or in Switzerland. Um, if you have this is a major difference with the system you have with the private insurances, the commercial ones. If in Europe, in most European countries, and their public or para public health insurances, you have a heavy illness, uh, then you are taken uh, on totally free. You ha don't have any of the normal out of pocket payments. So we protect the people who are heavily ill. Uh, there are definitions. Uh, in France, for instance, it means uh, to have a long-term illness. That means it's either expensive, even if it's a short-term one, like a transplantation, or it's a chronic one, like uh, diabetes maybe, or it can be something, you know, chronic, expensive, very, very bad illness like cancer or AIDS. Then uh, the doctors say this, uh, we have lists about it in France, a list has a few hundred illnesses, uh, then you are completely free of charge. So this means when I go to the doctor with a little, a little thing, a little problem, I have some pain here or I go to bed cold, I will have to have a tiny little co-payment. But if I have a cancer, I don't pay anything. The medicine is free, the treatment is free, all the exams are free, and generally it's for a certain period, let's say five years, and after five years, the doctors would have to renew this permission and the health insurance will pay all of it. So, and the same applies to poor people. They get the care free, but because they don't need to contribute to the payment because they are freed of all the payments because they are thought not to have enough money. So they don't do out of pocket payments, even for small illnesses. So the whole system is protecting heavy illness and the poor people. And all the others who are not so heavily ill or very healthy and are very rich or a little bit rich, they pay the whole, the whole thing for, for, for the whole system. 
with their contributions. So that's completely the opposite. There are two business models, completely opposite, between private commercial health insurances, which start to cover all the world, all these new emerging countries with their huge populations, and the system we developed in Europe. And I think we are more or less alone in Europe, and there's Australia and Canada, but the US has still a lot of traces of the private system. Uh, Obamacare changed a lot, but not completely. So I wanted just to make it sure it's the reverse. When you have a heavy illness in India or a heavy illness in, in, in Europe, uh, your situation will be completely different. And that is the business model based on solidarity, uh, which makes this happen. You know, it's, it's because health is, a, is considered as a very important uh, value. Okay, is this clear? Yes, perfectly clear. We can, we can, if there are questions, we can go back to this later. Now I will start to do what I have to do today. I try to stop myself after I have about uh, 18 or 19 slides, and I will try to uh, make a break after six or seven that we can have 10 minutes. Maybe 10 minutes I will speak, and 10 minutes we may have some exchange, not to make it too long for, for the professionals and may have something to say. And then afterwards, we still may have some time for, for discussion. I try. Otherwise, you have to interrupt me if I talk too much and too long. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I can't see you. <laughs> I know whatever you speak would be very relevant. Okay. To be start. So today's topics and questions will be uh, about epi uh, pandemics, epidemics and pandemics, because we have had a few and they change completely our, our uh, thinking about health policy uh, because we had forgotten about infectious disease or transmittable disease. We thought that our, uh, uh, our medicines, antibiotica, could, could get us free from it and we forgot about infectious diseases. And now they are back and there will be more and more of them for reasons we know, which are connected to the uh, environmental questions. So, first of all, we try to see what are epidemics as policy problem, because I come from political science. So, we will look why, we will try to understand why public health risks are also political risks uh, and even economic risks, and uh, take two empirical cases COVID, oh, there's a spelling mistake, sorry, COVID, which you all have lived through, but there has been a big pandemic pandemic before, which was in many ways similar, but in many ways very different, which is AIDS. And uh, so we try to sort of compare and see what we can learn from these two different cases for learning for society, for policymakers, and for healthcare systems and health professionals. Okay, so I will use um, a political science approach and the speciality would be public policy studies. So. I'm sort of studying the health policies and the health systems, the institutions, the actors, the conflicts. And I will give you a few concepts which may be interesting for um, our professionals to understand in general uh, policy problems. So whether it's education, education, or whether it's uh, health, health policy problems, just a few uh, very far-reaching concepts, which may be useful for them for everything, especially for health policy, uh, just for their general sort of knowledge. So, and, and I will use a few of these terms whilst I'm talking. So there is a policy problem. What is a policy problem? Why do we talk about policy problems? And then there are wicked policy problems and ill-structured policy problems. So uh, what does these terms uh, mean? The policy problem is, and then I have a different, um, different um, concepts like the three I's, problem framing and policy process and implementation. And then I will stop with politics, polity and policies. So I think then they have a sort of basic knowledge about how to look at policies and uh, Indian policies or whatever policies. The policy problem, uh, the term means it is a problem in the way it is posed to policymakers. 
Uh, so if there's a problem about education, then the parents have a problem and the politicians have a problem and all sorts of people can have a problem. But the policy problem means what is a specific description or uh, structure of the problem as policymakers will confront it, will have it. And wicked policy problems means they are very difficult to to solve because it's not enough to put money in it. You need more than other things than money. It's long term, very often long term problems. It's it's problems which are extremely difficult to sort out and to find solutions. That is, for instance, um, yeah, health problems. Because if you really want to have a good health policy, you should fight all the risks. And after what I saw from India, you should change your your behavior on the traffic on the, on the roads, you know, <laughs> because it makes many injured people, I think, or risk behavior in general, and, and, and our food should be different and so on. So these problems are completely outside the healthcare system, and they are wicked policy problems because they, they question the whole, the whole of our society. So they're difficult to solve. Well, we call this wicked policy problems. Ill structures problems means well, they're a little bit wicked, but they could, be, they could be solved. The problem is the known solutions to this type of problem or the agencies that are used to treat these problems, they don't have a solutions. They don't have a ready solution. They need to find new solutions. In, in a way, it means the problem, the structure of the problem doesn't fit the structure of the institutions, agencies, and uh, concepts and philosophies used normally to solve the problem. AIDS is a good example, and COVID also, because there are new aspects in these epidemics compared to what we knew before from health policy. So our agencies and our knowledge is not ready to solve that problem. So this, the problem doesn't fit in to what we have. So it has this, what we have, that has to change. It means reforms. Huh? So wicked policy problems sometimes can't be solved with reforms, but ill-structured problems, they can often be solved with good uh, reforms that fit. Now the three E, it means E from institution, institutions, interests, and ideas. So interest means actors, all the policy actors. If you want to, for instance, to put up public health insurance with a, a general access, you will have actors who are against it and actors who are for, uh, in favor of it. Yeah? So against would be all the private health insurances, for, as an example. And you have institutions which already exist and institutions have a long life and they do not, uh, they always condition somehow the, the solutions for a problem which you can invent because the institutions are long, long, long term. Uh, things with interest inside, all the professionals who work there and so on. So if we want to understand the policy problems, we have always in search for solutions, we always have to look what are the institutions concerned, what are the interests involved, that means which are the actors with their interests, the policy actors, the people who have interest in this issue. And ideas, that means what are the conceptions uh, the different actors have. That can be from scientific ideas up to beliefs or ideologies and examples, if I would ask for examples. For instance, the Chinese thought uh, with their surveillance of the whole population, they could uh, stop the virus and it was a failure. But that was a belief, an ideology. So this is the, the, the part of ideas in policies and in policy making. Okay. Now, policy framing means how the problem is fixed up. I can say uh, op uh, an epidemic is a problem of behavior, or it is a problem of uh, economics, or it's a, it's a problem of, of bad agriculture, or whatever. Or, uh, so once I, the, the different actors have different frames to, to, to say, to name the problem. An educational problem can be, or oh, the parents are no good, or the schools are not good, or the or what they have to learn is ideology, and that's not good. So according to the, the discussion about between all the policy actors, one sort of framing, framing will in the end dominate, 
And that's the first step to policy framing, uh, how the policy will be framed. So we make the policy according to how you see the problem. Uh. Problem framing is the first step to the discussions and then the dominant actors will impose their framing and sort of condition the policy, influence the policy making. And then you have the policy process, so that means all the actors will try to influence the content and finally try to put it on the agenda or not in Parliament, for instance, for decision making. So you can see this is all very long and very complicated, especially in democratic countries, because many actors will have different ideas and they will all fight. So, um, well, the problem is, first, we will see this with AIDS and also with other epidemics. The process, the policy process to make a policy, first of all, you have to see the problem. And we learn with every epidemic, at the beginning, we didn't see it. And it came out in some circumstances, which then affect the framing of the problem and the agenda setting and eventually the implementation of the policy solutions. So implementation, that's the last step of the policy process. That means you have to do the things that were decided. For instance, the government decides the healthcare reform, and then you have to implement it. And that is a very important uh, moment because many actors who have not been present in the policy process can be very present or even dominant in the implementation states. Let's say the professionals, the doctors, they have a large autonomy of how they work and they can change reform or reforms at the stage of implementation. For instance, the government wants to save money and gives you a list of these are the medicines you can prescribe and not others because they're too expensive. And the doctors may want to prescribe sometimes other things because they think it's better. So we just do it and that will, you know, change your reform. So I want to say to the professionals, if you are not very happy with the reform or with the things in your, in the health policy you are working with, then just try to do it other way, because you are the ones who dominate in the implementation uh, phases in the last, in the real, real, the, the application. So, and then a few words to stop this is politics, you all know what this is. It means mainly the electoral competition and the all the, the things political parties do, it's uh, about fighting about power, uh, about the political power. Polity means uh, the network of actors, so of interests, who uh, dominate, dominate a certain policy sector or a certain policy, let's say, in the health assist, in the healthcare uh, policy uh, sector, there will be the professionals, the doctors mainly, and there will be health insurances and those and finance ministry and these people, they end up knowing each other in the national associations or when they sit around a table to negotiate. So this would be the policy, polity of health policies. And the policies, that means simply the, con the content of the policy, what, what you decide and what you implement. So these are some, I think, some basic terms which you can try. You will get my, my PowerPoints. You don't need to take all the notes of it, you know. I will send it and we put it on your website. So this may be helpful for you to see more clearly what's happening in your in your sector in which you work and how you may be able to influence what's happening. So that was some political science. Now a little bit about uh, Europe and uh, multi-level governance. This is just a picture to show you how the World Health Organization is organized. They have six regions. Yellow is Africa, um, blue is Europe, red is America, South and East, etc., etc. So you have India in, uh, and the Pacific region in, uh, in green. So, uh, oh, sorry. So this is a world seen by the World Health Organization. And now look at this region for Europe. I don't know whether you see my, my, my little flash going around on the screen. This is a European, uh, European region. You see it goes from Israel, Israel is this little country here, blue, to Greenland, 
and to Kamchatka in far away Siberia. So you can understand that this is very difficult to make policies in the European Union. We, do, we have not only the 27 member states who have competency about healthcare, uh, national competency, this has been explained in other courses, but we also have the European region of the World Health Organization and we want to collaborate with them. But this is what it looks like, our region. I mean, there's not even Greenland on it, there's just Iceland. Greenland is here and Israel is here. And you can see here in green, you have all these uh, European Union countries, uh, the older ones, and, and also Norway and Switzerland, which are collaborating with the European Union, but not really members. And then you have blue countries here, Eastern, uh, Central, what we call Central Europe. We used to call it Eastern Europe, but now we call it Central Europe. And also Turkey is part of this. So that means the European Union covers the green parts and most of the and, and all the blue ones but not but not not turkey and i think here is no this is romania poland okay and then you have here the baltic republics and uh, you have uh, moldavi which are also in the european union but they're considered being eastern europe that means considered as if they were linked to russia somehow so what i want to say here with our multi-level governance, there is not only the European Union and the member states, there's also the, the World Health Organization, and they do collaborate a lot, but the World Health Organization, the European region of it, is very diversified. Just think about Mr. Putin's Euro, uh, Russia, who is sacrificing his population in a war in Ukraine, and our welfare states in Europe, where we try to save every life for a lot of money. So, uh, or the, the, the Muslim countries here, Turkey and also here Mongolia and all this they have a completely different attitudes towards maybe women and contraception and things like this. So it's very difficult to make a common health policy, but we do sometimes succeed, especially in public, public health issues. I just wanted to show you the complexity, okay, and the diversity. Now AIDS, what is it? how to fight it and what lessons to draw and how to compare it to COVID. AIDS means, as you know, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It was discovered visibly 81. That's not so long ago. It's some 40 years, 45 nearly. But as we see, it existed long before. I will say a few words about the older history. And it is caused by the uh, human immunity deficiency virus, the VIH. And its origin is zoonosis. It came from African apes, okay? And it was dispersed worldwide uh, by human migration routes, by traveling, and whether for work or for, for pleasure or even for sex. As you know, it's transmittable by all sexual fluids from sperma, vaginal secretions, intrauterine life, that means pregnancy uh, and mother milk, uh, by blood, be it medical blood, transfusion or blood-derived medicines or mental dental care or birth giving or breastfeeding and also uh, our breastfeeding should be wiped out we have mother milk here and also drug a drug addiction or oh, there's this word should not be there so no this doesn't mean anything i forgot to wipe it out so it's essentially a sexual contact and blood contract uh, contact so this gives us an idea about the prevention methods, which are sort of linking three different strategies. One is changing behavior, sexual behavior, and drug abuse behavior, via health education with safer sex and safer shooting. You can't, you can't control the sexual behavior and the, the drug abuse as easily as you think. So uh, we just have to educate the, those who practice this uh, to do it in a safer way. So safer sex may, means here essentially condoms and safer shooting, take a clean needle and don't share your needle. And for the society, it means accepting that there's deviant behavior. Because if we exclude these people and, and, and just punish them, they will not collaborate with the policy and they will not want to change behavior. Uh, medical hygiene is a second part. It means 
not only access to care, and uh, it means that hospitals are clean, that you don't uh, transmit via blood transfusion or medical intervention uh, viruses to the patients. And of course, it means also access to care and counseling for all the people who, who are concerned with this AIDS or later on COVID. And it means protection from victims with some social policy to support them. So this was globally the AIDS uh, framing and story. Now, just a little bit about the history. I said the visible start was in 81 in a very rich country in the US, because in some other country probably we would not have seen it yet, maybe 10 or 15 years later. And we have a precise di date. On the 5th of June, 81, the weekly little journal of the Washington, uh, uh, what is CDC? D D Center of Disease Control. They published the first article, a very short one, on a new illness, which was unknown, and apparently it concerned mainly homosexual men. So uh, it was discovered because in Los Angeles, this disease center noticed that they got prescription coming from Los Angeles doctors with a very rare medicine about, uh, I think it was antibiotica for some lung disease, but something which is very rarely prescribed. And they noted there was a lot of prescription suddenly in Los Angeles. They contacted the doctors and they traced it back to five, gay, uh, five patients, these doctors, three or four doctors who were at the origin of these prescriptions. And they turned out all to be gay men uh, with a rare lung infection and had this rare medication. So it's because there was a very good uh, accountancy system about the prescription of doctors and which were analyzed in a time when we did not yet have artificial intelligence and found out. And it was just these few doctors who cared for these five gay men that made the thing visible. Now, I put here underneath that AIDS, we know today, existed already in the, in the 1920s, not, not 20, there's a uh, spelling mistake, sorry. In Kinshasa in the Congo, doctors had noticed, and missionaries, also such Catholic doctors who worked there, that there was a strange illness which I prescribed, and the prescription, they didn't understand it, the prescription corresponds to AIDS today, uh, and they kept actually blood samples, dried blood. And when they analyzed it, after we had the anti-AIDS test, test, it was positive. So there, were, there was AIDS in nine, 1920 in the Congo, in Africa. And when we look back into medical, there's a very good book about the history of AIDS by somebody it's called Grimek, a medical historian. Uh, historian working in the US, I think, or in the United Kingdom, writing in English, but it's translated in all sorts of languages, the history of AIDS. And he relates in many, in several chapters, all the cases which we have analyzed now of medical descriptions, which are all 50 years, 100 years, and the oldest is from the 17th century, uh, concerning a black slave who was shipped, working on a ship in Japan and got very ill. Uh, he was working on the ship and he was so ill that they left him in Japan and he died very soon afterwards. And the Japanese doctor who didn't understand the illness he had kept a record and that record is still there and it is exactly the description of symptoms of AIDS. And this person came from Africa. So uh, it's just to say illnesses exist a long time before, but before we discover them, we have to have a context where you can actually see things, because you have the science or because you have the public health system, which counts many things and traces many things. And so that was the history. The first cases in Europe, a doctor in Paris had been reading this article from this journal here, a very small little journey, four, four pages every week, because he had a subscription. And that was in June 81. And when he read this article in the coffee coffee break, he saw, oh my God, the patient I saw this morning, he had exactly these symptoms. And he made the patient come back and examined him very closely and found it was the same and he was a gay man. So, and he came from the, um, uh, how do you call these islands? 
the Bahamas, the, the, these West Indies or the West Indies Islands. So that's very near the United States. Then a few months later, we found the first in Europe and especially in Paris, the first uh, in, intravenous drug users who had the same symptoms and hemophiliacs and migrants from Haiti. People, uh, France owns a little part of somewhere near the hut in these islands and people from there who live here had signs of AIDS. So this is how it started. So it started visibly in the countries, it became visible in the countries that had good healthcare systems. By the end of 81, we had 270 cases in France and 120 had died the same year. That was 50% of death. And it, uh, you know, people were very scared. Now the first test, we developed them in, uh, in America and in uh, France at the same time, which made a big war about who was the inventor. 84, we had the first test, but sort of manually produced, and uh, it was licensed in, in, 80, in 85, and mass production could start. So from that moment on, we could really test the people and see whether they had AIDS or not. And that's also when we tested all these old blood, dried blood that was kept in some archives somewhere, and we found there was AIDS since a long time before. Okay, two decades later, in the 2000s, there was a big alarm in the United Nations. Risk, um, the, the United Nations were worried about AIDS being risk for international security because UN Peace Corps came back to their countries affected with AIDS, probably because they had uh, been in Africa with many civil wars and they uh, used prostitutes or maybe also uh, violence to women. Anyway, they got infected. And the problem was countries didn't want to send uh, their soldiers anymore to the UN peace missions because afraid of AIDS. And the other idea was AIDS was becoming by 2000 so massive in Africa that there were regions where all the adults were either ill or dead and uh, there were left only old people and children. And they thought in such regions weakened by a weak population may uh, be at risk of invasion from, from you know, all these private armies or from the neighboring country, that armies would get out of control if the soldiers are AIDS infected and now they, they will die. And there was an idea as the food and agricultural organization from the, um, from the United Nations that there might be a, uh, risk of hunger and then violent revolt in some countries. So the, the situation in Africa was very, very worrying. And today, with our, uh, how do you say, provision of, of very effective medicine to all those poor countries as well, AIDS is under control. You don't hear so much talking about AIDS anymore. The center of AIDS today, after, uh, according to the World Health Organization, is not in Africa anymore. It's under control. It is in Russia. So that gives you an indication about the connection between public health problems, epidemics, and political regimes, uh, where you have a mixture of poverty, violence, non-respect of human life. So today, AIDS is still spreading and developing in uh, mainly in Russia, a little bit in Central Asia. In the rest of the world, people are more or less uh, have access to the treatment and the prevention is very much developed as much less infection. So when we say AIDS is still developing in, for instance, Russia, what we measure is how many new infections of the HIV are there per, uh, let's say, 10,000 or 100,000 inhabitants in that and that and that country. So you can find all these reports at the... Uh, World Health Organization's websites. So the result of this drama in the 2000s in Africa was that the United Nations got directly involved. In 2001, we had a Security Council meeting one week only on AIDS. Normally, they only talk about war and peace. It was the first time in history that they talked about a health problem. And the General Assembly of the United Nations in 2001 was concerned with the main subject of AIDS worldwide. And in 2001, 
uh, the pharmaceutical firms in, in um, oh, I have to go a little bit further. Why 2001? Because in Africa, uh, in South Africa, the apartheid regime was finished. Nelson Mandela got to power. And the general director of the United Nations in that period, and for a long time he was in that mandate, was an African, a very intelligent African man who was married to a Norwegian lady. Um, so these two men, I think, they collaborated. Anyway, South Africa in 2001 or 2000, when they were free from apartment, uh, from, uh, uh, how do you say, from this racist uh, discrimination, and they had uh, Mandela in, in power, they decided that everybody was going to be, uh, to have free AIDS care, to get this, in those days, still very expensive medicine, which was uh, not available generally in, in poor countries or to poor people. So the government decided they would buy it from India and from Brazil, who made copies, and they would just give it to their people. And what did the pharmaceutical industry do? They went to the law court in South Africa against the government to say this is illegal, it's our intellectual property and we want our money and we want our patents protected and if you want to produce this you have to give us money for our patents, for our innovation. Okay, this uh, complaint to the law court in 2000 caused a worldwide protest and mobilization under the leadership of France and the European Union. And then they organized the World AIDS Congress conference, which is every two years in uh, Durban in South Africa. I was actually there too. Um, there were, I don't know, 20,000 people all concerned with AIDS research, whether doctors or social scientists, and they all were very much angry uh, with the with this pharmaceutical industry and finally seeing this huge protest the pharmaceutical international companies withdraw the lawsuit there's never been and they decided to collaborate with the united nations and the world health organization to set up the aids uh, international fund who is funding all this uh, financial business worldwide collecting the money and distributing it to the poor countries okay that was, um, now we come to the ill-structured uh, problem. AIDS was really an ill-structured problem. Here I found the original uh, reference. It was some technical men, not so social science, some technician who invented the term to say if we have no known solution and no known previous procedures to solve a problem, when all this is not adequate, then we have an ill-structured problem, as I told you. That was invented because of some technical problem. There was a technical problem, and the procedures and solutions they had, they didn't fit. So, And the social science took it over. It's a very important concept now in political science. So if we have an ill-structured problem, it means we need new solutions. We need to frame the, pro uh, the problem as it is, the policy problem and search for new ways to, to solve it. And it will probably entail multiple resistance of all the interests of all the actors which are invested in the formal solutions and they don't want to be you know, mixed up with the new policy framing. And that happens very often with uh, uh, public health issues. Just imagine if India decides suddenly that they will introduce a public, really public, health insurance with really uh, access for everybody. You can imagine that there will be a lot of resistance of many, many policy actors against it, okay? So when we go back to AIDS, I, I would invite you to keep this reference, a book by, edited by Kerb and Bayer in 1992 uh, about AIDS and they, put together, I think it was 15 countries, something like this, to look at their AIDS policy and try to, to analyze it and compare it. And they came out with the results. There are basically two different approaches. One is control and contain, so control the AIDS, the virus carriers, contain them maybe in some prison or in some or at home, but sort of limit their freedom. 
And there was another approach uh, which finally won the battle between these two approaches, which I called participatory. It meant um, as AIDS was affecting, affecting people who are sort of marginal minorities, homosexual men, um, Africans in the beginning, uh, and uh, um, drug abusers. So these people must be taken into the policy. We must find their representatives to think, to first of all, that they tell us their problem, why they do this, what they do exactly, and then get uh, doctors and public health officials in to say why this is very risky. And, you know, examine when you have homosexual sex, they do things differently than other people. What do they do exactly? The government doesn't know. But AIDS opened research on this, and it was only possible with the participation of homosexuals. Otherwise, we would not be able to know what they exactly do and how infectious it may be or may not be. So, and then they have probably ideas about the policy. What do they need? You know, when these men are expelled from their, from their families, that they don't like them anymore, and they don't want to know them anymore, the parents, this, this happened less today, but in these you know, 30 years before, uh, they will need help to, have, uh, to live somewhere. And if they're ill, they will need help because they can't work anymore. So there are all sorts of problems connected, which when you're from the outside, you don't know. But if you take these people, the victims, into your policy framing and into your policy process, they will probably be able to provide solutions because they know the problem better than you. And you can find then solutions which will be effective. This is what is meant by participatory approach. It founded the new public health uh, approach, what we call today new public health. The old public health was you have laws to shut all these people away who have infectious illness or, or sexually transmitted transmittable infections. Today you would treat this differently. You, you, you also have more medicine and we don't need to shut people anymore away. Tuberculosis was something uh, very massively present in Europe in the after the Second World War because of poverty, because of the war, because everything was bombed in, in some countries like Germany and people didn't have a place to live and lived in bad hygiene conditions that favors tuberculosis, etc., etc. So um, you, would, you, you put these people in sanatoriums away from their families. And now you wouldn't do it anymore because you have antibiotica and you can give them antibiotica and they can stay at home and live normally with all other people. So uh, new public health means uh, more respect for the individual person at risk, participation if it is useful, especially when you have to do with marginal populations who are a little bit in different cultural setups or in, in, in big poverty, or you have to make them participate because you need them to know what they know in order to make a good policy effective for them. And policy learning, it means we have to stop our taboos about certain things like homosexuality. We have to stop social control like they did in China <laughs> with the COVID. Uh, we have to stop isolation if it's possible or coordinate a new type of isolation as we did for COVID, you know, people at home and then try to bring them their food and, and um, cluster research with, uh, with these COVID, anti-COVID applications by uh, cell phones, etc. So anyway, the message is stop discrimination and stop taboos and co-construct policy with those who are at risk. That is new public health. And it meant that the former laws about infectious disease and sexually transmittable, infect, uh, transmittable infections are not, have not been applied to AIDS because it was a participatory approach that won the controversy between the two approaches. So AIDS has not been inscribed in Europe on the list of epidemics, sexually transmittable infection, and uh, yeah, these two. It is inscribed on the list of illnesses which a doctor has to declare. This, yes, but that's for public health. There's no name on it. 
it is anonymous as uh, figures, uh, codes which are secret. So there is a protection of personal uh, data. Now, if we summarize all this, we can say the policy pro process, as we saw it in eight, in eight, with the timing and the main issues and the actors was like this. From 81 to 84, there was problem recognition. We tried to understand the problem in order to frame it. The questions were, what's the origin? How is it transmitted? What is the extension? Is it big or small? Is it a pandemic or is it just local little things? Once we had the test in 85, we could use the test to see, to answer all these questions here, transmission, uh, pandemics or not. And we could use this test to understand the, the diffusion and then trace also the origins and the contamination chains maybe. But once we had the test, there was a big uh, political controversy about how to use it. Should it be used for individual um, consent, with individual consent, or should it be applied to the whole population or to risk groups? And there was a big discussion about what is the individual and the common interest about the different ways to use the test. And the main decision in Europe has been, especially in Western Europe, has been only with consent of the person and everything has to be secret, has to be uh, protected, the data. You can use it for public health, but with secret codes. And it has to be a doctor who will tell you the result. You won't get uh, an SMS telling you you are positive for, for the uh, HIV virus. You would need to, a doctor will tell you in order to sort of be kind to you and that you can accept it and understand. So the second period was controversy, but it was very quickly finished. It lasted just a few months. It was extremely violent between extremist uh, conservatives and extremist progressists. And it was sorted out finally by some sort of scientific understanding about the public health policy problem. So it was framed as a public health problem, not a, as a problem of, of deviance and bad people. So that was, uh, and once we had this, this conclusion, we could do prevention campaigns because we had the test, we knew where it came from, what the origin was, the transmission, and we had lifted a few taboos in order to, you know, advertise condoms, for instance. But then started um, a new period of middle, from the middle from the 80s up to the middle 90s about, about these public prevention campaigns with what message should we put in, for whom? Should there be for everybody the same message or special messages for risk groups? Um, but that was a very difficult uh, problem. You see, it, it lasted a few years. Uh, the question was, if we, if we make very hard campaigns that people will be afraid, sort of telling them you must not do this and that, and you will be ill and you will die, because in those period people still died from AIDS massively, or we should make messages like the French did, very happy ones, you know, I can remember a few, you had a, in a, when summer was approaching, messages about uh, condoms, Condoms are uh, wishing you a happy holidays. We had a lot of condoms dancing around in different colors, wish you a happy holiday. Uh, and it meant somehow if you take a condom, you can have a, you know, very safe sex and you don't need to worry. So that was for everybody, especially for the heterosexual general population in order to prevent the, the passage massively from the virus, of the virus from the specific risk groups to the general populations. And we had a period when the word risk group was sort of politically not correct. And I assist, assisted uh, um, in, in, in discussions, I heard discussions in, colo in uh, congresses where public health specialists said, why can't I use the word risk groups? It's an essential concept in my science. We always try to find which populations have what risk and how it's transmitted to other populations. <laughs> and the response of AIDS militants were, was always, AIDS is a risk for everybody, there are no specific risk groups, there are only individual risk behaviors. 
So that was a big, a big issue. And it was eventually some years later after we had the blood transfusion scandal, if you say AIDS virus entered the blood transfusion system and the hemophiliac died ma massively because they get blood transfusion or they get a medicine made from human blood. The policy changed and it was back to what I would call normal. Then co campaigns were much more made towards risk groups with their participation in order to make the right messages which, which they could understand. Because if you make very general messages, uh, it's not enough for the risk groups. So it's not efficient for them because they're very specific uh, in their behavior and their risk behavior. And if you make it for everybody, then people say, oh, it's the wrong message. What are they telling me? I'm not at risk. I'm a very faithful husband and my wife is faithful. We don't, we, this is rubbish. So it's inefficiency on both sides. So for public health issues, generally, you have to treat it specifically for the risk territories or the risk populations in order to make clear messages which they understand and correspond to what they are doing and the risks they have. Okay. So from the mid-19s onwards, I would call the, the policy period normalization because we had efficient medicine. So it's by medicine it was normalized. It became normally chronic illness. You have to take a, a few pills every day, your life long. And social acceptance. People now in Europe at least and in, uh, I think, Canada, Canada uh, Australia and so on, they accept that there are people who have AIDS and uh, they got it by behavior, which maybe everybody would not find very good, but there is no discrimination and no, no bad talk about it anymore. It entailed also public health reforms to make the blood transfusion uh, system clean. And uh, it led, as I said, for South Africa to an international global initiative to provide medicine to all the poor countries for AIDS. So this medical treatment is called HART, a highly active antiviral rectoviral treatment. And it started sort of in 97. And uh, later we had quick tests, very, very, and, and now we have even pre-exposure treatment and, and ex-exposure treatment. If you have taken a risk for AIDS now and you have big dates, don't wait for a test, just rush in France into a, pharma, in, into a pharmacy and get uh, these pills and you take them and you won't get AIDS. So we have a lot of progress and all this apparently is not available in Russia, although it is a powerful country apparently. And that's why AIDS, AIDS is just uh, spreading and spreading still in Russia. So it needed high level international involvement, which started in the you know, early 2000s. And that was a very big victory about, uh, about an epidemic. I may, uh, I may stop here a little while. You may have questions or something. And then we go on. I have here the summary of the factors that, are, that bring you success or failure in your AIDS policies. And you can later on compare with COVID. Uh, we can go through this very quickly, or we can wait for some comments from uh, the professional students. Okay, so I think there's just one question put up by uh, Ms. Anandita, which is about the uh, participatory approach which you explained for AIDS. So she wants to understand whether this is possible for COVID as well, which I feel is not, but probably you can explain it to her better. Uh, how this can be, this concept yeah. can be, ah, yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. I don't think I have a, 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 such a perfect answer the question is perfect <laughs> uh, i would say when the question was we have to when the when the government told us you should wear masks uh, participatory would maybe mean that um, everybody tries to really do it and behave according to it you will tell me now this was the government who told you but it was not really the government, it came from scientific people, because when we discovered how it is transmitted, uh, then we needed masks, and there's only the government who can sort of provide immediately masks for, for a big, huge population, like in India, for instance. 
participation could mean also that uh, when you had uh, that if you have a, a, a risk or you had signs of COVID, maybe you should go and have a test. And if it's positive, you should warn all the people around you with whom you have been in contact. So participate in the in the implementation of what the government told you. The difference between AIDS and COVID is exactly this participatory in the policy framing, uh, the problem framing, the policy framing, and the search for new solutions was much bigger in AIDS than in COVID because AIDS was connected with very bad subjects. The politicians didn't want to talk about it in the first two or three years. Only experts talked about it because it was about sex, very bad sex, you know, multi-partner or, or, you know, unfaithful husbands and wives and or youngsters very, very free or, you know, homosexual sex. And it was about drug abuse, intravenous drug abuse. So uh, people and policymakers didn't know what exactly was happening in these sort of subcultures. And they didn't want to talk about it. And they also had the idea, oh, this is not very important. It concerns just a few groups. So, and it was the participation, bringing these groups into the, into the discussion with their knowledge and uh, also their, their educational faculties over their members. You know, if you, for instance, the, the good image of what was a very good homosexual man before AIDS was having many partners, having a very extensive sex life. Uh, there was a, the, the term back black rooms, black rooms, black color. And it was these bars who had completely dark rooms behind the public part. And you could have sex there with people who you didn't even, you didn't even see them. And this type of festive culture was completely cut off by AIDS. But who knew about this and these factors? And once this came out, uh, the idea was this has to stop. But how can you stop it in a, in a, if you are from the government and, and there is somebody who runs such a bar, there's no connection between you two because you are in completely different worlds. So the idea was the representatives of the homosexual communities, they could talk to the other homosexuals and to the businessmen who run these bars and explain to them, well, this you must stop because, because we're all dying. And this could only be done by insiders. You know, people don't listen to somebody who is not from the inside, especially on delicate issues. So that was part of participation. I didn't say that because there's so much to say. Uh, if you have a difficult issue, let's say now a, a much easier subject, uh, equality for women. I think you need women to participate to frame the problems and the policy and look for solutions and discuss with the government, et cetera, because they know best what is unequal in their lives and what could change easily or less easily, where we would need government help to change. The woman could tell you. So that's why it's important to have women in the parliament and in the government. And um, uh, for COVID, it's a bit different because COVID really concerned everybody and there was no, uh, how do you say, no risk of discrimination, except that people may be afraid of their neighbor who had COVID or of your neighbor who was a doctor or nurse, afraid that from hospital they would import COVID into the, into the apartment house. So otherwise there was no bad subject about COVID, except maybe some people had funny beliefs about it. They thought the gods punished them and gave them COVID. Or, but this was minor. We have clear scientific... Uh, so, or, or the vaccination, the vaccination, maybe the participatory project uh, question concerns also uh, a lot vaccination, that people really do get vaccinated. Uh, you can have... Uh, the people in the different groups, um, let's say people who are not so educated, they don't know so well, if they have somebody from their own group, their family members, their neighbors, who know and can explain to them, 
that they have to get vaccinated, especially the older people. They we listen much more than to the television spot from the government. So, but I admit the participatory um, uh, public health approach is uh, very effective and very necessary for anything that has sort of underground movements, uh, very marginal cultures uh, involved, much more than a than for COVID. The COVID problems, as we, we will see in the end of what I say, is much more about how do you manage a problem which stops the economy. Well, that's a different policy problem, you know. That's a good way of understanding the term policy problem. The policy problem for AIDS was completely different from the policy problem for COVID. There are many similarities between the two. Uh, including the difficulties governments had to make a good policy. But uh, on the issue of was there something very shameful or not to be treated is different. It's one of the big differences between the two. OK. So, Professor Monica, what I understand is you are going to soon talk about COVID-19 as well after this. Uh, yeah. So, so, here... so I think what we can do is we have some more questions. But what we do is we first finish the presentation. And okay. then we go in for questions because uh, we are running maybe short of time. It's ah, okay, long. okay. So you finish your presentation first and we will take up the questions at the end depending upon the time we are left with, okay? Yeah. Uh, right. COVID, COVID will be shorter because you know the story much more than the AIDS story. <laughs> okay, fine. You <laughs> no, will go ahead with that. From, from, the AIDS, from the AIDS story, I concluded that a summary of success factors to dominate this epidemic was quick, consensual, coordinated government action. And I think that's true for COVID also. That's probably true for all epidemics. The problem is quick action is difficult if you don't have the knowledge, if the scientific knowledge is not yet there. Consensual is difficult as long as you don't have a very hard scientific evidence. And coordination is always a problem. So, But anyway, quick, consensual, and coordinated government action is important. You can't manage epidemics without that. So and it has to be oriented by public health expertise, public health goals, and public health research, and not other ideological things here. Respecting the citizens' right to privacy, care, and social support, I think that's true for all epidemics. And uh, you need an efficient healthcare system with really universal access for all. Because everybody you lack, can transmit the, the, the illness to somebody else. So that's also why universal access was very important. That was brought forward very much by the, um, by the um, homosexuals. They said, if we don't get good care, there's a risk that we spread. So, and, and there must be research to find the, the medicine. OK, now COVID. What are the origin, the characteristics, the policy challenges? Although the similarities with AIDS is both have a so zoonotic origin. It means both came from wild animals living too close to humans. And if we say that, we have a big question for the future, that's population growth. If we have a human population always growing, we take the place of wild animals and they will try to survive and live closer and closer to us and come into our cities or outskirts of the cities. And that what makes the risk of transmission between uh, for, uh, transmission of viruses from wild animals to humans much bigger. So we may have to think about our population growth in the future. So it's all the problem is about ecology. If you have a destruction of nature, you will have more and more epidemics. Because it's in the wild animals, especially baits, who is a big reservoir of viruses who are potentially uh, mutable, can, can mute and, and, and be adapted to humans. So uh, the rapid diffusion by uh, globalization worldwide is common to these two. Uh, with the difference for AIDS to jump over the whole world, it, it needed 60 years from the 20s to the 80s, and COVID did this within uh, one month. <laughs> so that's a big difference. So we don't have the time to discover, really, and to, to get ready. Uh, 
in structured problems uh, for the two. Governments were without preparation. There was uncertainty about what the problem was and how to fight it, lack of equipment. There was a lot of ideology, ideology and political fighting around. All this was common to the two issues between COVID and AIDS. And behavioral change was needed in the two cases. Now we had to put on condoms. And now we had to put on masks. I used to say, to explain it clearly, it's the same thing. A condom is a mask which you put somewhere else, that's all. Uh, social distance or sexual distance. Uh, stop mass e mass events, massive events like uh, big uh, pop concerts, uh, something like this. Uh, or for AIDS, it was more stopping the underground life of uh, drug abuse, or teach them to take clean needles and maybe stop drug abuse. And the same was true for the homosexuals. Stop these massive festive events and uh, turn to public health. Uh, for COVID, it was stop traveling, and for for AIDS, there was stop sex tourism. It's a certain type of traveling as well. So you have uh, these similarities and differences. Uh, the big differences between the two is uh, COVID is highly infectious. AIDS is not infectious. It is just transmittable, which is a very important difference. You have to do certain things in for transmission of AIDS. You have to have either sexual inter intercourse or blood exchange or unclear needles from hospitals. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't travel by air and you don't get it because you touch a table where somebody touched this before, uh, as it is by COVID. COVID goes by air and that's really infectious disease, contagious. Uh, every is and it means everybody is at risk and it puts at risk the economy. It's not a moral issue, it's a massive economic issue. So, uh, AIDS was very much a moral issue for many people until we decided it was not moral, it was technical. Uh, that's framing. You know? And uh, COVID is clearly a massive economic shock because it concerns everybody because it travels by air. Uh, massive hospital needs for AIDS, uh, for COVID. AIDS, of course, we needed hospitals, very specialized, but less numbers because the people concerned at the same time were less. Yeah. Uh, the death toll, the people who died, was inversed. Uh, COVID killed old people, poor people, and people with polypathology. AIDS, in the beginning, killed very many young people, the famous yuppies, uh, minorities, which were very often elites, artists, journalists, and so on. And afterwards, it turned into a social margins. Homeless, migrants, drug addicts are the AIDS victims we have since the last 20 years. Uh, and for for COVID, why well, it was everybody, but the people who died were especially the old ones and the already very ill ones. So for for COVID, we have a medical treat, we have a vaccine, we don't have for AIDS, still not. Uh, we have no treatment, not yet for COVID, but we do have for AIDS. So these are the differences. Um, so main policy characteristics, it's it's... I don't want to tell you the whole story because you have followed it, you have lived it, it's contemporary history. But what is maybe new for you is this concept of a total social phenomena. A total social phenomena means everything in society is concerned, from family life to burial habits, the economy, the financial uh, business worldwide, everything is concerned by uh, what we call a total social phenomena. But COVID caused this. So COVID was a total social phenomena. I wouldn't say that for AIDS. It was not. It was global, but it was not a total social phenomena. Did not. It did not change my life, for instance. COVID did because I had to sit at home and couldn't see friends and couldn't travel to India and things like this. Um, the other problem is uh, the other concept which applies to to AIDS policies is what economists call the triangle of impossibilities. It means you need to do three things. You have three absolute equal priorities in order to solve a problem. And you can only succeed one of the three. Eventually, a little bit the second, but not totally. And you cannot have the third. 
So this is what we call the triangle of impossibilities. No government, however good it is, however rich it is, can deliver all three aims simultaneously, which in the case of COVID are protecting health, avoid illness, infection, and death, protect freedom. That means uh, you cannot at the same time protect the health of the whole population without having a shutdown, without a uh, limiting traveling without having social restrictions or on 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 rave parties for instance and without vaccination duties so protect freedom where everybody can do what it likes at, at every moment and protecting health in case of covid is it cannot work together it's contradictory and you and you have the third uh, aim you have to manage is protecting the economy that means maintain full activities and income for the people. Otherwise, people will die of hunger. So you have health, freedom, and economy. And it's impossible to reach the three goals at the same time with what I said before, quick, consensual, coordinated government action. You have to make choices for COVID. Which one will you will give priority to? So... Um, because you cannot reach the three at the same time. I think you do understand that. Um, and you have witnesses it in, in the different countries. Um, and because you cannot fulfill the three at the same time, the public, especially in democracies, get angry and lose confidence in politicians and in science. They will say, this government is bad. It didn't protect my health or my freedom or my economy. Um, and there will be protests and anger. So this is one of the dangers of epidemics like COVID. It is difficult to manage politically because you cannot satisfy the three things at the same time. Uh, and then people will get into protest, very violent eventually, if it's about, if it, if it brings them into hunger, let's say. Uh, and they will lose confidence in the political system and also in science. And you will have conspiracy ideas in the, in the social networks and fake news. So all the bad things. And uh, so that's, that's the main issue of COVID. And that was slightly different for AIDS. Uh, so the solutions to come out of this problem with the three things is mitigating the impact. Uh, so you need intelligent, realistic policy timing do the right thing at the right moment, the right priority at the right moment. You have to set priorities for the majority without forgetting the minorities. So if you set minority, uh, majority priorities, which would probably be protecting the economy, this is what Sweden did. They didn't have shut ups. They didn't tell people to stay at home. They said, go on normally, you will get herd immunity and it won't do anything to you. And they had a lot of dead people. So uh, they had to change it afterwards. So don't forget the minorities, the people that may be very much at risk, like your elderly for the COVID, COVID, or the poor people, or in India, these migrant workers who couldn't go home and stranded somewhere without having necessarily uh, the possibility for social distanciation or even lacking a, a place to sleep and, and maybe even food. So you have to do priority set setting in a, a very realistic and intelligent timetable. So, for instance, you could say uh, goal setting, first of all, emergency is saving lives. So what do I need to do in the hospitals in order that I can save the lives of the people who, who really come there in, with danger to die from COVID? So one of the things to do is to stop the transmission in order to lower the load of patients coming to the hospitals. This was the French discourse of President Macron. We have to limit social contact and have to wear masks. Even if we don't have masks, we can, we can produce masks even at home in order to preserve our hospitals, that there be, will be beds available for those who really need it, because otherwise they die. So emergency may be saving the lives of some minorities, huh? those who are really very ill. Then short-term goals, slow down the infection because it saves he or saving lives. And it may, may be good for the economy. So slowing down infection, mass social distanciation, etc. 
and secure income and jobs for the people. Because after the epidem epidemic, you want, you want to go very fast up again and, and, and repair the economic damage. So that may be for the short term. Mid term, maybe combine subtle exit strategies, how you get out of you of your uh, first restrictions, not like China, who one day decided it's finished, we open everything and then massively people died. You do have to think uh, beforehand about the exit and uh, how you can uh, upgrade your hospitals. They need ongoing support. Huh? And selective in the second, here you have short term, you have to give to eat and money to buy food to everybody first of all, all those who can't work. And in the second step, you can maybe be more selective with your economic support and give it to those who need it most and not to everybody. People can telework and they don't need it anymore. So you have to think about these things. And long term, you have to really have recovery policy for after COVID for the long term, for the next 20 years. We don't want to see this again. So. Uh, rethink about how to organize your economy, your health sector, do the renovation of your hospitals, create independent production capacity for key goods and sectors. This is what we try to do in Europe now, to produce more essential medicine on the European territory, not to depend on China uh, or even on India. If the transport breaks down and if everything is shut down, we don't have anything. So maybe we should re-industrialize a few things and we should also renew the international health governance uh, around the um, World Health Organization, make it, make it better for the future. So, um, so I think we can, yeah, I can stop here. So the key problems for policymakers when they have poly, uh, epidemics if, when they are confronted with epidemics, is they have to govern and take decisions in the conditions of urgency and incertitude. They don't know quite because the science is not yet ready and it's urgent. So it's really a difficult job. Um, so this, <laughs> there's something wicked, <laughs> wicked, wicked policy situation. Even if the problem is not wicked, you can solve it, but the situation is wicked. Uh, the next problem is how to impose in popular measures, especially in democracies, so that people are stopped, they can't go out, they can't get travel. How do you impose this on people? They will come with the argument, my freedom, you know, you have to be very uh, intelligent how to do, manage this. And you have, of course, a problem of coordination and implementation of all these measures, especially coordination between national levels, regional levels and local levels. That's every epidemic shows this. AIDS also had this. Uh, and then think how to solve the tree lemma to protect uh, health and life and protect the economy and protect public and private freedom. So you have to mix and mitigate. I think we can stop with this. <clears throat> Last thing, comparing both these zoonotic pandemics, AIDS and COVID, and what was there common or here very different. So we had lack of condoms, we had lack of masks, no preparedness in both cases and bad public communication in the beginning, in the first phases, first year for COVID, first three, four years for AIDS. Uh, we had in AIDS a contaminated blood scandal. Uh, now we have a scandal about the fact that we didn't have masks, we didn't have respirators, we didn't have medicines, they are legal legal procedures uh, running in France and some other countries in Europe against government officials because we didn't have a stock of masks, we didn't have sufficient respirators and so on. So what did they do not right before the epidemic? You know, why were they not ready? Um, yeah, okay, so there are legal procedures in both, both epidemics created legal procedures with punishment, uh, COVID is not yet done with punishment, but it will come. And this is particularly high level conflict in France. So the policy problem was for AIDS to accept social de deviance and marginal cultures uh, for COVID. Oh, but sorry, it jumps up uh, all by, by, by itself. Uh, the policy, 
problem was to accept the reduction of freedom and the reduction of economic activity. And this was, of course, difficult for the government, who had also to provide the funding for economy and for research and for care. So we needed targeted prevention for AIDS and general prevention for COVID for everybody, same message. In, in, in AIDS, we needed different messages for different risk groups. And uh, so that, that's the main difference between the two in terms of policy problems. Yeah? The risk was uh, discrimination for AIDS and so a political risk. And for COVID, we have an economic risk for great poverty. And I think India has experienced that. What else? Uh, civil societies have been very active in AIDS. In uh, a economic, in an in a epidemic like COVID, it's more the central government and then in collaboration with the regional and local governments, it's less the civil society. Uh, they can be useful, but their role is not completely essential as it was for AIDS. That was the question about participatory policies. So, uh, yeah, the key actors are fighting in both cases. The number of deaths uh, in one year, approximately half a million, one million for today, now, huh? last year's for AIDS. And we had six million in two years in uh, for COVID. So, although figures are not very exact because all these countries who don't have the best statistics and always medical tests, but still the indicators we have, they say today COVID kills three times more than AIDS. I think I will stop here because the rest is about the European Union. You have heard parts of it. I would have had a few little different things to say, but it's not really essential. Essential. I can we stop here? If you like, otherwise we can come back to the European. Okay, thank you, Professor Monica. I indeed you made it look very interesting, the similarities and the differences between the two pandemics, both being zoonotic, but what are the similarities and what approaches could have been adopted to combat them. Yeah. So we, we have a few questions uh, basically about like uh, Dr. Arunjit wanted to know uh, which country in EU was, EU was most affected by AIDS. Uh, about Russia, it is still very much, you know, um, the cases are increasing in Russia because of, uh, I think you discussed that, but in EU, which is the country which was most affected? Warsaw is. Uh, You're talking about the, the, the period when AIDS was really a big problem or about today? Uh, I think he wants to know right at the beginning. Uh, what? Yeah. Be. But now it is under control. So probably yeah. when it was fulminating at that time, uh, which country yeah. was most yeah, of yeah. it? So you can guess from the transmission roads, which are basically were sexual and were uh, linked to drug abuse. So if you consider the policies of drug abuse and the policies concerning uh, sex in the different countries, you get an indication about this. So to, to, to answer in terms of countries, I think a long time it was Spain, Italy and France who had most AIDS cases on much longer than other countries. You had again the same division of Europe than you have normally. The question is very intelligent because uh, if I have time, I could answer interesting things about the history, the long-term history of Europe, which in my opinion has, has influenced these things. So we had the south of Europe with much more AIDS um, the first 10, 15, 20 years. And even today, it's a bit more. Uh, and France is part of it. Then in the north of Europe. Scandinavia and even Germany had always, if you take the numbers of people who have been infected by, by the virus or the people who died or the people who, are, who were at the one point in, in hospitals with AIDS, you have this north-south division. And Britain was somewhere in the middle. They jumped up and down a bit according. They had a very good policy from for the drug abusers, a very liberal one. They did not really uh, put them in the underground. They were sort of collaborating uh, since long with them in order to promote needle exchange. They 
it said to the drug abusers instead of sending them to police i said come to my bus i'm driving around every week i will give you a cup of coffee and a clean needle and you don't share that needle because there's hepatitis b they had with hepatitis b they made the apprenticeship for what was coming with aids and they didn't have very much much they didn't have many contaminated people from the drug scene except in edinburgh because edinburgh they nearly all died because Edinburgh refused that policy from uh, the beginning onwards. And when they realized they had to change their policy, all the drug abusers were more or less dead and dying of AIDS. So the problem was more or less resolved. Uh, today, it's a little bit different in Britain. They have, they have done so much saving of public money and became so conservative in their government that they uh, abolished certain programs and AIDS spread again um, among drug abusers, but not as massively as in Portugal and Italy. So the epidemic was drug user driven in Italy, Spain, and later on in Yugoslavia, Greece, around the Mediterranean Sea. And it was homosexually driven in Britain, in France. And France was very proud of its sexual freedom. And the thing that was bad in France, they had a very Rest, uh, repressive policy towards drug abuse. Uh, so these people lived underground and there was not much money to really put on programs and then these programs of needle exchange were not accepted by the government. So the drug abusers, they got all very, very heavily uh, victims of AIDS and they spread it to the to the um, heterosexual community. Uh, to the heterosexual general population because okay. they were not oh, yeah and in the northern countries you had a mixture of very liberal policies on the two subjects and a lot of a tradition already of collaboration with the group of patients with the drug abusers with uh, homosexuals the collaboration started around hepatitis b long before aids so they had they had a tradition and so we had a north-south uh, frontier. Uh, but it's now with normalization and the treatment and you know, AIDS is, is not an issue anymore. There, we, we still have contaminations and there are more in the south than in the north. But as we have a treatment, it's dropped out of the agenda. Yes, I think most countries have been able to control AIDS and bring it uh, yeah. you know, in control. And the, the cases are dropping. Yes, same is true for India as well. And uh, yeah. Uh, the... Lucky to hear that. Yeah, it's good, yes. good news yes. because it's such exactly. a horrible illness. I don't wish it to anybody. Uh, so, you know, there's another question. Uh, I think the final one is regarding um, do we have any authority in EU uh, which helps in controlling and preventing uh, AIDS? Like in India, we have NACO, National AIDS Control Organization. And at state levels, we have SACS state AIDS control societies. So do we have any such similar authority in uh, Europe? Uh, for AIDS? Yes, for AIDS control. Any yeah, particular just, authority just, which works at, you know, maybe the member state level or the EU level? Yeah, member state levels, they make uh, all their policy. I think I go to these, um, to these little things here, uh, the three things I, I prepared. Maybe uh, you, can, you can explain it briefly, and I, I yeah. hope you're going to share this presentation with them. Uh, so probably you can just briefly dis uh, explain it to them. You so know, it's, it's, uh, there is no European Union competency uh, in terms of law, but there is uh, what we would call um, uh, intergovernmental logic. So these health ministers... Finally, as nobody knew what to do with this new illness, they all went to Europe and said, what shall we do? And then they were fighting. I do this, but what you do is bad, and so on. And they came to some compromise and understood what, they, what, what are the best practices. So on those two levels, uh, condoms and uh, clean needles, uh, Europe was important because they could benchmark and they could say, oh, it doesn't work in your country because you have a bad policy. Why don't you do like the others do? This is very powerful. And the big issue was when we enlarged the European Union towards the east, where the communism fall down 
and about 10 countries wanted, former communist countries, wanted to join the European Union in the, in the 90s, it was a big problem because the European Union didn't have health policy in those days, very little competency on, on transport or things. But in the Eastern Europe, when the communist uh, governments broke down, everything was lost. They didn't have states anymore, they didn't have administration, they didn't have the public hospitals, the pub everything was public. And it broke all down and the people went working in, as taxi drivers or immigrated to Western Europe and they had a rush of, of uh, infectious disease from cholera up to AIDS. And AIDS was just blowing up. And the West of Europe, the European Union, the traditional old ones, the restricted one, Western one, didn't want to have uh, a transmission of all this towards the West. So they were interested in integrating these countries into the European Union as quickly as possible. That was, of course, first of all, an economic issue, but also a public health issue. And they, they, they needed to help these Eastern countries, these future member states, to, um, to finish with these problems. I mean, they had tuberculosis, they had malaria, they had, you name the, the, all the syphilis, all the sexually transmittable diseases and AIDS. And it was growing, growing, growing. So the Western countries tried to help these Central European countries and even Russia to, to manage the problem. And that was done very much on a, what I call here an infra an infra statist level. Um, on the contrary to COVID, which was uh, treated directly at European Union level and uh, country level, or top government level. AIDS was treated very much more on local levels with civil society involvement and professionals. So what Europe, Western Europe did, they had a lot of, they gave money for AIDS research and made it compulsory that uh, civil society people participate, not only research in laboratories, so that means health professionals, public health people, and even you know, AIDS communities or whatever. And the issue was collecting data, making harmonized statistics that we have comparable health data, and networking, it was done by networking from professionals on infra-government level, infra-national level, to avoid all the public uh, fighting big with the big uh, parties, with the traditionalists and the liberalists. And all. So in, diffi in difficult fields, you can work with professionals on an infranational level and sort of do policy coaching by these professionals. These professionals from the East who work with their colleagues from the West to, to, to find solutions to the problem in, I don't know, Odessa or in Poland or wherever. When they come home, they try to put up projects and do things, and give, the, give the needles out to their local local uh, victims of uh, drug abuse and AIDS. So they will get some money from the European Union to do this and to do meetings with uh, locally or on the European level and do some research projects and collect data. And once they get home and they have this money, what will they do? But well, they will talk to their local politicians and say, well, I need this and can you collaborate with me? I have this project and the money. And it will change the ideas of these people, even if they're not professionals, those politicians. And it will eventually walk, walk upwards to the government level. And this process from the bottom upwards by professionals around data collecting and best practice that made the European Union very efficient for AIDS, although they don't have competency on this particularly. Today they have because they have a few institutions, but it's mainly data collection and statistics and reports and things like this. And with COVID, they went up a, a, a big step. And we have had the lessons on this already. So for AIDS, I think it was, uh, we have to think backwards, 30 years backwards. And it was a lot of networking by professionals on the ground and it produced harmonized comparable statistics, which allowed benchmarking. And it was with European research money. That was basically the, pro the, the, the process. Does this satisfy you? 
uh, I think yes, he has already written that. Um, thank he has thanked you for answering the questions in detail. And uh, before we end this meeting, I would like to thank you very very much. And as usual, your session was really interesting. And it is I think a number of times each time I listen to you, um, you know I. I am glued to the uh, presentation. Thank you. Oh, very thank much. you. <laughs> yeah, and thank uh, you so much. Uh, okay, then thanks for finding time and uh, satisfying all the participants on various issues related to AIDS and COVID. And the triangle of impossibilities was a, was a very interesting way to put it because all governments face that um, that dilemma. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what should be the priority so uh, once again very very um, thankful to you for um, enlightening us on this topic thank you dr professor mm -hmm. monica thank, thank you thank you for the right, I think we are going to end the meeting now thanks I everybody will, for joining thank you I will, I will be online for next week to listen only to listen yes yes so you put me in your have link sessions one on 18th another on 20th yeah, so I would expect you to be very much there. Yeah. Thank and you. I uh, thank all the students who spent their time with me. <laughs> I would have liked to see their hospitals and talk more to them, but maybe next year. Yeah, we we, 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 we wait 